Father in heaven, I come before you and ask that you would be the teacher of your word tonight. That we would learn from your word. And that we would take these serious words to heart. For Lord, they are challenging for us. And Lord, as you speak, Lord, may your Holy Spirit teach every heart and bring a message to every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. So 2 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 18, we're going to read through verse 22, and then we're going to talk about it together. It says, For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness... They allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness. The ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves to corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness having, than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But as it happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now, I want to share something with you. If those verses there, you started going, <laughs> that makes me uncomfortable. Good, because they should. That is a very serious statement that Peter is making, but remember in the context, he's talking about false teachers. And so we're going to be able to come back and look at this in its context. Please understand that the life we live is a spiritual battle. How many of you guys understand that? It's a spiritual battle and we're fighting against the things that would draw us into the world and back to the world when we're following the Lord. And so the battle that we're in is severe and it's unrelenting. And I need to let you know something. The spiritual war is not over until it's over. And it's not over until you stand glorified in the presence of Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Peter continues to warn his readers of the dangers of false teachers. He reveals to us what they are like. He says what they will end up like and their destruction. But he warns believers that as we read this, it would seem possible that they have actually escaped the pollution of the world, but then have entangled themselves and again become overcome by those things of the world. And they, we must carefully study the next five verses because they contain some sobering and critical information. And it's sobering. Um, I will share with you, my morning did not go like my, mor my normal morning. Um, as I'm pouring over the word, as I'm pouring over these things, I'm calling friends of mine that I've known for 30 years that are other pastors. We're talking about these verses together. We're going over these things. And so I want to share them with you. And I, I just want you to remember, don't let your mind wander. Stay in the text. We'll, trust me, we're going to deal with it. What you all freaked out about, what you heard, we're going to talk about it. Okay, don't, don't go there yet. We'll get there when we get to verse 21. But not right before. Now, let's go ahead and talk about this. Now, I have set this up in my notes to uh, call the false teachers the bad guys and the deceived the good guys, all right? So as I go through this, I'm going to say that when I get to the they's and the them's so you get a better feel for the context of the passage that we're in. It says, for when they, that's the bad guys, right? The false teachers speak great swelling words of emptiness this is a description of arrogance. The false teachers are arrogant. They think that what they know is more important than what anybody else knows. In fact, they think that what they know is really more important than even what God says. And they're in a place where they really do feel 
that what they think is more important than what anybody else thinks. And they think more highly of themselves than they ought. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says this. He says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. How many of you have ever been in a place of life where you thought, well, you were all that, right? And how many of you realized pretty quick you were nothing, right? Yeah, I got this all going on. I'm gonna share with you a funny story as long as my wife doesn't give me one of these. Okay, now, um, so when my wife and I first got married, we were married, well, I think we were in less than 72 hours, right? And we're thinking, we should write a book. We got this marriage thing down, right? Like we love each other. We've got this going on. And just but before you bug her, it was probably me that was doing most of this talking. Um, it's like, hey, we got this down, man. We got marriage figured out. We've been married for three days. We got this thing going on, you know? We should start writing these things down we're talking about. And, and five days into our marriage, um, we drove across the country in a Ford Ranger, it was a standard with no air conditioning, with her life packed in the back. And as we're going, things got stressful and we had a little, not so uh, slight discussion on our way home, uh, you know, somewhere in Wyoming, I think. And <laughs> I ended up riding in the back with all of her stuff. <laughs> as she drove the rest of the way home. And there's more to this story, but please understand, I ended up back there because of me. me. It was my fault, because we were arguing over getting home, and I'm thinking we should stop and rest. And she's like, no, we should just keep going. We're almost there. And so, and well, that's true. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we were broke. So, she's like, so the issue is, if you want to sleep, sleep in the back. I'm driving home. Uh, so it was really an interesting thing because we went from this place of really thinking we knew what we were doing to realizing we didn't have a clue. And after over 25 years of marriage, guess what? I still don't have a clue. See, these guys think they've got it going on. False teachers take what is really empty and void, their false doctrines, and they blow them out of proportion. And what happens is they come to this place of, as the NLT puts it, they brag about themselves with empty, foolish boasting. They're bragging about themselves. Basically, one of the distinctions that marks a false doctrine is the arrogant exclusivity that it creates. It masquerades itself in spirituality, but in reality, they're just saying we're better than everybody else in these boasting words. And it says, it goes on, it says, they, the bad guys, allure through the lust of the flesh. This is the idea of these teachers are hiding behind a spiritual mask. In reality, they're teaching things that appeal to the flesh. So when they're teaching, they're teaching things that appeal to people's sinful, fleshly desires. Many of those teachings were like the Gnostics. The Gnostics taught that you could do whatever you wanted in the flesh. It didn't make any difference. Because they said, well, all flesh is bad and only spirit is good. So therefore, whatever you do in the flesh doesn't really matter. But it does matter. You can't just go do whatever you want. That's sin. That's inappropriate. And cultic teaching today appeals to the flesh and many times because it's based upon works. Hey, if you do enough, you can get to heaven. Church, how much, is, there what, is there enough that we can do to get to heaven on works? No. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, right? That's it. it it's, it's, by, it it's not by works of righteousness, but by the washing, regeneration, and renewing of the Holy Spirit, Titus 3, 5. It's not by works that we're saved. And cults lean us in that direction. But he says through lewdness, lewdness is shameless sensuality, twisting what is evil for good and good for evil. The idea of pushing that, he says, now, he says the ones, the good guys, speaking of that, he says the ones, the good guys, who have actually escaped from those, the bad guys, who live in error. So basically he's saying these guys put out bait with the flesh to draw in and stumble those who've actually already escaped those that live in error, the bad guys. 
It's this idea of bringing people to a place of stumbling again. It seems for us that as Peter is informing his readers that there are those that are out there that have escaped the things of the world but yet are being seduced and lured back into error again. And that's what false teachers do. False teachers draw people back into error. A lot of times they exchange one error for another. Because they become very deceived. So a person might, they believe in error, but then they reject that error and believe another error that a false teacher or a false prophet has brought to them. Now, verse 19 says this. While they, the bad guys, promise them, the good guys, liberty, freedom. They themselves, the bad guys, are slaves of corruption. Now, The false doctrine promises freedom, but in reality, false doctrine enslaves. But it enslaves both those who believe it and those who teach it. So you have the bad guys who are promising the good guys some freedom, but the bad guys are themselves slaves to corruption. And another way to define this word for corruption is destruction. They are slaves to destruction. They are these awful, terrible people that are drawing people away from the Lord. And it says, for by whom a person is overcome, by him, the bad guy, also he, the good guy, is brought into bondage. And so the idea is that what happens is that person gets overcome by them and they're brought into bondage. They're not brought into freedom. Please understand that false teaching, false doctrine, leads us to a place of bondage. It doesn't lead us to freedom. There might be a promised freedom, but it's often a promised freedom of the flesh to be able to do whatever you want to please yourself, but yet when we live to please ourselves, ultimately we find ourselves in bondage to sin. Now this principle was taught by Jesus and can be found throughout the New Testament, but in John chapter 8 verse 34, it says this, Jesus answered them saying, most assuredly, I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. So if you commit sin, guess what? You're a slave to it. By the way, if you're a slave to sin, what does that say about sin? That means sin owns you. Right? How many of you ever had something happen and you just went, yeah, I totally got owned right there, right? You know? Like a situation happened, I just got owned in it. You know, guys, that happens. When you're in sin, sin owns you. That's the joy of the cross of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ has broken the chains that bind you to your sin and you are set free through the blood and the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. That's the reality of who we are. Well, Titus 3.3 says this, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, Living in malice and envy, hateful and hating of one another. Or hating, or hating one another. By the way, for those of you who want a little extra homework, I will give you something to write down in your notes. Romans chapter 6, verses 13 through 22. We don't have time to go through all of it tonight. It's a whole other passage about this idea of being enslaved to sin. Now in verse 20, it says this. And this is the important part about understanding who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, in the context. It says, for if, after they, the bad guys. Now, I want to share with you, why do I say this they is the bad guys and not the they that got stumbled by the bad guys? Context. Context here is key. Because Peter is talking to the church about false teachers And false doctrine that's come in through these false teachers and these guys that are basically torturing the early church with their bad teaching. And so, for if after they, the bad guys, keeping it in the context of the chapter, have escaped the pollution of the world through knowledge, this is epigenosis, we're going to talk about that in a second, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is where it gets uncomfortable. He says that knowledge is epigenosis, which means a correct and precise knowledge of. It's saying that these bad guys who had escaped the things of the world through the correct knowledge of Jesus Christ. By the way, if somebody has a correct knowledge of Jesus Christ, would we assume that they were a believer? Yes, we would. We would assume they were a believer. 
For sake of argument, I'm not going to go on either side of the spectrum yet. Let's just talk about it for a minute. Let's assume they have a correct knowledge of Jesus. And it's a, it, this true believer, they possess that. And it would seem clear that he's describing somebody who's been delivered. They've been born again, essentially. They've escaped the pollutions of the world. Now, describing one like this, that has been delivered some, from sin, we see a clear picture of God's deliverance, yet we have a really stiff warning. It says, they, the bad guys, are again entangled in them, okay, the pollutions of the world. So they, having been delivered from the things of the world through the correct knowledge of Jesus Christ, they then are again entangled once again to the pollutions of the world and overcome. We'll talk about that in a moment. The word again implies a repeat. Okay. How many of you remember your former life when you were entangled with the pollutions of the world and you've been delivered? Yep, right. Okay, how many of you would say going back is a good idea? <laughs> None of us would. None of us would want to go back to that mess. Oh, I sure wouldn't. I wouldn't want to go back. I would never want to go back to the things of the world. Now, Peter describes those who are once entangled, finding deliverance, going back to the entanglements again. Entanglement simply means involved in, getting wrapped back up in it. And there's only one other place this Greek word apply, appears in the New Testament. It's in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. So, sorry, 2 Timothy, not 2 Peter. I'm in 2 Peter. I'm referring to 2 Timothy. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says this. No one entangled in the spiritual warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. He says, man, if you're fighting the good fight and if you're entangled in spiritual warfare, you don't get entangled with the world. You don't get mixed back up with the stuff that you left. You left it. You don't go back to it. But how many people do you know that play with the edge? Do you know what I'm talking about? They just want to see how close they can get to it without going all the way in. And they mess around. It can be very, very dangerous. But the idea of being entangled, he says, again, they go back and they get entangled in the things of the world. And it says that they're overcome. Now, overcome is different than entanglement. Overcome describes a final state of defeat. You have been overcome. You have lost. That's what being overcome means. Being aware of the difference between entanglement and, being, and overcoming, and being overcome by something, is important. Because I guess you could say, if we read this, we could say, hey, well, entanglement could describe like a, a Christian who's backslidden, struggling with sin. We could see that. But we could also see somebody who's overcome as a person who is described as totally defeated and totally giving in to the state of depravity, again, succumbing to and surrendering back to sin. But here's the thing I need you to remember. In the context, he's talking about false teachers who have entangled themselves and been overcome. So the false teachers have gotten tied up in it and it has defeated them. That's the situation that they are in. And it says of them that their latter end is worse for them than the beginning. A person who has experienced that again experience, they find themselves in a worse condition spiritually than they were before they were originally delivered. How many of you have ever known somebody who came to church, got all on fire for Jesus, and then wandered back into the world, and did you notice that that second condition was actually worse than the first? How many of you guys know people like that? We do. How many of you have been there? Thank God for his grace, amen, right? That God is a God who can deliver once, twice, <laughs> three times a lady. No, 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 but listen, but no, it's, <laughs> sorry, it's been, a, <laughs> it's been a day. But listen, I mean, we, we, we come to a place where we have to understand that, that God can deliver. It says in the word that he can save to the uttermost those who would call upon him. But here, listen to what Luke says. And it also says this in Matthew. But it says, Jesus, when he was dealing with the issue of, of an, uh, having an unclean spirit leave the house. 
and, and not having something go back into that place. By the way, when we're delivered, Jesus needs to come in. Do you guys know that? You, you can't just say, oh, I'm gonna stop. That's, ref, that's being reformed. That's changing the outside. You can't clean up the outside. You need to be changed on the inside. And that means when that stuff leaves your life, Jesus has to come in. And it says this, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order because of that deliverance. And he says, and he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And he enters and dwells there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. So often we don't realize that people come to a place where they play around with the things of the world. They get entangled again, and then they find themselves being overcome by them. And so often when that happens, that second state is worse than before they came to know the Lord. Now, verse 21 says this, and this is where we're going to get into those issues. We're going to talk about them now, okay? Verse 21 For it would have been better for them, the bad guys, not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Now, these verses are self-explanatory. How many of you, if you didn't have a theological disposition to Arminianism or Calvinism, would read this and go, that's a serious warning and it means what it says, it says what it means. How many of you be there? Right? Okay. So, what happens is people have a tendency to interpret this statement depending on their presupposed theology or their study of the word or their upbringing and how they feel about different things when it comes to the idea of eternal security or of losing your salvation. These verses should scare anybody who is on the side of you can lose your salvation, (laughs) okay? And for those who are saying, well, you're eternally secure, these verses cause a problem for you. Because you just have to read it for what it says. You have to then assume that they were not saved in the first place. But then that goes back to saying that somebody with the correct knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is not delivered. Right? So there's some hiccups here. So some will use this text to support that a true Christian can forfeit their salvation, his or hers. Others insist that this could not be the case, referring to that, true, that, that these guys cannot be true believers for the fact that other verses promise eternal security. I mentioned this a little bit Sunday when we were dealing with the issues uh, of hell in, Luke, uh, ch- sorry, in Mark chapter 9 because it talks about the idea of, hey, be careful you don't fall away lest you find yourself in the place where the fire is not quenched and, and the, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And so let's talk about this. Regarding these, the informed perspective will say that these guys were never saved. The Armenian's perspective will say that they were actually saved but lost their salvation. So let's talk about it for a moment. Reformed theology, by definition, is what we would call Calvinism in the world we live in today. There's neo-reformed theology that happens today, and it's and it's just it's it's people taking the the word of God and saying we see these verses, and so we're going to stand on these verses, and it's going to push us to this side of the argument. Then you have those who are Arminius. Now these are talking about two men, Calvin and Arminius. Calvin and Armenius were a lot closer in the argument than the argument is today. Because, just so you guys know, they were contemporaries and they were friends. But what happened was, over the years, their students took the arguments and did this. Trying to prove who's right. Let me ask you guys a question. Since the scripture says, let God be true and every man a liar, in this situation, who is actually correct? God is correct. Some of you knew where I was going. God is correct. You and I will see from God's word that there is a warning against those who would walk away from their faith. We also see in the word that there is a security for those who are in Christ. So what do you do with those? How do you handle that? Years ago at a pastor's conference, Pastor Chuck Smith, he got up and he said, boys, a lot of you have been bugging me about this Calvinism thing, so I just want to share with you 
where I'm at with this. If you're in Jesus, you're eternally secure. And everybody, half the room started clapping. And then he said, unless you walk away, and then the other half of the room clapped. Okay? But isn't that a reality, right? What you have here, and I want to share it with you, is you have what's known in the scriptures as an antinomy. An antinomy are two truths that cause cognitive dissonance in our reality. So in other words, God is sovereign, man is responsible. The idea of being God is sovereign means he chooses predestination, which by the way is where you get eternal security from. But man is responsible is the idea that, well, look, I need to choose to follow and I also need to make sure I continue to follow. Those two truths are taught clearly in the scripture. I, I can't stand up here and tell you, oh, it's this one or oh, it's this one. There are lots of antidotes that we could share if I was trying to win an argument or a point, you know, in these areas. You know, we can argue both sides. But here's the issue. And I talked about it Sunday. If you desire eternal security, you, will, you abide in Christ. There you go. If you want to be eternally secure, you abide in Jesus Christ. And over the years, what's happened is in verses like these, there has been a bitter divide that comes in the church. And this divide has a chasm that gets wider and wider and wider, and it divides us instead of bringing us together. You understand that, how many of you guys understand that there's tension in music? That's what makes music cool, right? If music had no tension in it, it would be boring. How many of you ever watched a drama with no drama? Yeah, that would be just like Hallmark. <laughs> well, come on, you know how it's going to end. There's only, there's only one outline. Come on, don't be, hey, don't be, hey, don't be hating. Don't be hating, okay? Now listen, <laughs> but, but it's like, you know, it's the idea is like, if you watched a drama with no drama, there would be no drama. If you, if, if you, there was no tension, there would be no beauty. And so how many of you guys understand that if we could totally understand God, he wouldn't be worthy of being worshipped? And so it's okay for us to accept a truth that if I abide in Christ, I'm eternally secure. And somebody can say to me, oh, well, you're just taking the cheap way out because you don't want to take a side. Yep. <laughs> I, I don't apologize for that, by the way. I'm being honest with you. I don't want to take a, I will not take a side. But you know what the hard part is? If I'm talking to a Calvinist, they're going to think I'm a Calvinist because I'm not going to disagree with the word. If I'm talking to Armenians, they're going to think I'm an Armenian because I'm not going to disagree with the They're going to say, well, the Bible says this. I said, yes, it does. So you agree with what the Bible says? Yes. So you agree with me? Not necessarily. What? But you said you agree with the word? Yes. The word of God. Yes and amen. I agree with the word. Well, then you need to be this. I said, no, you don't, you don't put me in your camp. Do you see what's, what happens? Don't let people put you in a camp that the Bible doesn't say, that the, that the Bible doesn't tell you to be in. What does the Bible tell you to do in John chapter 15? Abide in the vine, right? Abide in Jesus. And so we abide in the Lord. And what happens over the years, because this, this debate, this divide, by the way, is focused on things that are unknowable because an antinomy have two truths that run parallel in tension until eternity. See, the idea of the resolution of these ideas is unseeable. And so they are things that are unknowable, unseeable, and because they're outside of our observation, they fall into a category very often where people become obsessed and disputes over arguments of words. Now, 1 Timothy, as Paul is talking to uh, Timothy, he lays it out in chapter 6. He says, if anyone teaches otherwise, sound doctrine, he says, do not consent and, and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus, and to the doctrine which accords to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, listen to what he says of this person, but is obsessed 
with disputes and arguments over words. And that's what you have when you have people get really bitter about this. Now listen, if you're in this room tonight and you are a five-point Calvinist, I love you. Okay? I do. I love you. I'm not, I don't disagree with you. Everything you say in the scripture, is, you, can, you can back that up from the scripture. If you're an Arminianist and, and and, and you, you think that people can lose their salvation and, and there's all these warnings and you're really happy about this verse tonight and you're a Calvinist and you're not happy about the verse. Listen, I'm gonna share with you right now. I still love you and everybody else loves you, but I might encourage you in something. Maybe you should come off of the edge and maybe come to the middle and find yourself in a place where you can say, you know what? My brother and sister on the other side of that hill, he agree, he's, he's using the scripture too. I'm using the scripture, he's using the scripture. Maybe we come to the middle and not be obsessed over arguments, over words. For from which, listen to what happens, come envy, strife, reveling, evil suspicion, useless wranglings of men, corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, who suppose that God is a means for gain. He says, from such, withdraw yourselves. Basic hermeneutics, for those of you guys who don't know, it's, it's how we study the scripture. I wanna share something with you. Every word in the Bible has a context. And I'm gonna share this with you. Every word has a context. It's the verse. Every verse has a context. It's the paragraph. Every paragraph has a context. It's the passage. Every passage has a context. It's the chapter. Every chapter has a context. It's the book. Every book has a context in its testament. And every testament has a context in the whole counsel of the word of God to which my family calls the uber context, right? Some of you understand that, some of you don't, that's okay. But the idea of the uber context, it's not, we're not talking about a ride. We're talking about the idea of the biggest context we could have, the biggest overarching truth of what the Bible is about. The Bible is about God made man, man fell. God has done everything to redeem that man and he calls man to himself. If you teach anything outside of that big context, we're not teaching correctly. And so all scripture, by the way, is true and profitable for doctrine. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. That, more coffee before evening services. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 say this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So I'm not gonna throw out uh, verses that I don't agree with because I've taken a, a hard-nosed position in some way. I'm going to take all of the Word of God. I'm going to take the whole counsel of the Word of God, and it's okay to read the Word of God and go, what? <laughs> By the way, if you think it's not okay to read the Word of God and go, what? Then you're not reading it real close. Because I read stuff all the time, and I go, huh? Lord, what does that mean? Yeah, come on Sunday. It's going to be fun. Because I've had two weeks to go over this with a few verses going, what do you mean by that? What do you mean and what do you want to speak to the church from those verses? And so we have to understand we take it all. And why do we take it all that a man of God may be, com may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work? But then as we start to close, guys, we get to verse 22. And verse 22 says, and it happened to them, to whom? The bad guys. It happened to the bad guys, according to the true proverb, that a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to the wallowing in the mire. Guys, one of the things that I, I want you to think about for a moment, if I'm teaching this for just a moment, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna teach this passage from an Arminianist view for just a moment. Okay. The Arminianist view would say, these guys were born again, and they walked away from the Lord. And there is a warning for every teacher who would ever teach the word of God to not lead people into error through the lust of the flesh. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and teach it from the, the, the Calvinistic side for a moment, which is, you know what? These teachers, and they, they, were probably, they were probably never saved. They really never knew the Lord, but there's a, there's a warning to every teacher here and that every teacher needs to take that strict warning that to never walk away from the truth and to not lure people away through the lust of the flesh. And if I come to a neutral position and I say, hey guys, whether these guys just never knew the Lord, although they might have had a, a knowledge and that word if is kind of important in there and, and maybe they were saved, maybe they weren't. 
But whatever's going on, they are drawing people away and unto uh, getting back into the world and tripping them up. And there's a warning for anybody who would teach, anybody who would come in and minister in a teaching environment in the word of God. Let not many of you becoming teachers know that you shall receive a stricter judgment. Do you understand? It doesn't matter if I teach to the left or the right or the center of the argument, the warning to those who would lure people away by lewd conduct to draw them away, to entangle them into the things of the world doesn't change. These verses speak to us about going back again. And we're not supposed to go back again. I mean, this is a rough quote that he ends with. He says that the idea is that no matter how much you may try and change the outside, you're still going to go back to what's on the inside. A dog returns to his vomit and a Sow goes back to wallowing in the mire. Do you know why a pig goes back to the mud? Because when you clean them off and everything, their flesh burns in the presence of the sun. Do you guys realize that for many times, many times for us, that when we're in the presence of God, we want to go back to the mire because what we're doing is wrong and our flesh burns in his presence. And we love darkness rather than light. For in the darkness, we can hide our deeds. We can kind of sneak back there and, and, you know, not get, you know, kind of hide. And we're supposed to come into the light because when we come into the light, the blood of Jesus Christ does what? It cleanses us from all sin. Now, maybe you're here tonight and, and you're thinking, you know, I have gone back. I have gotten entangled again into the things of the world. I want you to know that Jesus is here and Jesus can deliver you. Yep, you got tangled up again and you know what? If you're tangled up again, I'm guarantee you right now the state you're in right now is worse than when you first got in it. And maybe you need to come and you need to get it right with the Lord. Don't go back by the way, it's so easy to go back because it's the habit. It's the thing that we know. and We, we want to have a tendency to go back to the things and of, of, the, of the world. And so what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to we're spend a few minutes waiting on the Lord. Um, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward right now. And we're going to change the lighting and everything. And we're going to kind of go to that place of worship. Now, I want to encourage you. You can stand. You can sit. You can kneel. But here's what I want to encourage you in. If you need prayer, if you're entangled, if you're caught up, if you feel like you're about to go down, you know, one time, two time, three time, you feel like you're about to go under for the last time, maybe you need to reach up and you need to ask the Lord to come and and you just need somebody to minister to you. We're going to wait upon the Lord. The band, we're going to be up here. Please don't pay attention to us right now. We're not important. By the way, we're not important any day of the week. I just want you to know that. Because when we're here, we're not worshiping us. We're worshiping God together. And so we're going to be up here for a few minutes. And if you need prayer, we've got guys and gals that will be down here. And why don't you come and just receive prayer? If you don't want to come forward, why don't you just stay and just do business with God right now? But if you're messing around, stop. If you're playing around the edge of things, you're starting to get entangled, ask God to deliver you. Let's pray and then we'll enter a time of waiting. Father God, we love you, we thank you. And Lord, we're gonna wait on you for a few moments. As we wait on you, Jesus, I pray that you would give us courage. Those of us who who need prayer or need to come forward, that you would allow us to just not worry about the people that are sitting, not worry about the people around us, but we'd come and we'd receive that prayer we would see, receive that ministry of the body. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Water Springs Church. Check us out at watersprings.net. And if this video blessed you, please click the subscribe button. God bless.